Well, good afternoon. It's Friday again, and uh, I don't know which week of uh, of our uh, shakedown lockdown we're in. It doesn't really matter. We're moving forward. It's exciting. The sun is shining, and um, we are all uh, making the best of uh, these challenging times. But we're finding ways to enjoy life. You know, we've we, we're seeing new opportunities. These outdoor driving concerts. You know what? The market's starting to solve for these problems. That's what I love about our industry is given enough time, give us a little space, and yep. we're going to solve for these problems. We know how to move forward, and we're going to do it safely as well. Um, and I'm excited about that. Um, today, Pete, we're uh, we're picking up around the fake mega convention coordination. Um, Pete spent a lot of time coming up with that name. Um, but for those of you who are on Monday, um, this is uh, same package. Pete will talk about that in just a minute here about the inventory, how he built that in IES. And we said, okay, well now let's build this in Workbench. These are two very prominent platforms that um, uh, um, are, are in use today. And we thought, well, let's let's help do that. You know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, guys. I think this might be a show that Pete and I are going to work on in the future. And we're just going to have webinars so we can say, okay, we're going to bring you on and, and do this coordination for us and we'll just charge for it. But you guys do all the work for us. But uh, um, seriously, thanks for for coming on and, and bringing your insights around Wireless Workbench. Um, Pete, um, you want to just kind of set this one up for us and kind of what you did Monday and, and what your spec was and what you went through? Sure. Well, I, I thought I'd I would make a, a tech spec that that is really heavy into RF in a venue that uh, 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 has a ton of space and a lot of people, and and only just to sort of stress out uh, coordination. And, and this is not the biggest show that any of it as any of us have ever worked on. Uh, uh, Henry Cohen and I just worked on a show recently where he was the coordinator. He had over 600 frequencies by the time the uh, the, the 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 event really got going. But um, this is pretty 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 up there. It's a more concentrated thing. If you look on the drawing here, I've got a drawing of the venue, and it's got two halls: Hall A on the top, surrounded by two floors of breakout rooms and Hall B on the bottom right next door, which actually contains a different show in it. In that different show, they have uh, some uh, 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 a little bit of wireless, not a lot of stuff, but uh, um, it gives you something to uh, try to avoid at the same time. So what we have is in Hall A, we've asked for six combo wireless Axiom Digital on frequency diversity. Uh, four channels of PSM 1000 uh, using both both left and right of the units. Uh, and then at nighttime, there's a wireless event that comes in there, uh, an entertainment event with their own equipment. So because they have four handheld wireless UHFR, not digital, and four uh, guitar wireless and eight stereo in-ear monitors. So those have to be accounted for and they rehearse during the day. So you got to have it sort of all one giant coordination. And then in the 60, in, in the, in the, um, there are a total of uh, uh, 16 breakout rooms uh, on either side of the hall, but they're pretty far apart. The hall is 250 feet wide plus the hallway. So conceivably you could use the same set of frequencies on one side of the building as on the other side of the building. And each of those rooms has uh, four uh, LAV wireless, uh, ULXD, and uh, one channel of IFB. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I, the, the scans that I sent actually are from uh, New York prior to the end of the um, uh, uh, repack. So there's, uh, it doesn't exactly match New York now. But it, but it, uh, but it, it, it's an interesting set of scans because I did one set from outside, and one set inside the venue, which has a totally different uh, 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 amount of RF inside because it's a pretty well protected venue. So it gives you that chance of using the spectrum that you can't use outside. So um, if you have any questions, of course, use the questions. Uh, 
button in your go to webinar panel and uh, um, uh, we'll just be following along and and we'll leave it now to uh, to uh, to Corey and Jason to uh, lead us through uh, wireless workbench go for it yeah and um, I'll just want to throw one thing in there Pete is with these questions we're gonna do just a little differently than than maybe the usual we'll let we're gonna step through this coordination by we I mean Jason and Corey um, and um, We'll, we'll, we'll go through that process. So keep your questions coming in, but be specific about the areas because we're gonna try and come to those then at the end so we can get through some of this a little more logically without always interrupting. That's something we're good at, but we're gonna work really hard today <laughs> to uh, let you get through there. If, there. if there's something we're finding a lot of you know questions, we might pause, but you know, take it away. Thanks a lot, guys, looking forward to it. And I assume, Jason, you're gonna be sharing your screen first, right? I think Corey's going to kick this thing off here. Yeah. There you oh. go. Oh, you here. ready, Corey? Yeah. Sure. Awesome. There you go. Let the screen share come up. There we go. We're guys. seeing your screen. Yeah. All right. We're in there. Sounds you are good. there. All right. Let's uh, make sure that when I move to something, you can also see Excel. Yes. yes sir. Perfect. Perfect. All right. This. So yeah, thanks for teeing that up, Peter. Um, I think one important place to start with any coordination is definitely figuring out, making sure that you've got your channel counts uh, that you're looking for. Uh, so one point of uh, clarification that I wanted, uh, for example, are these IFB channels. So you mentioned that uh, the host is going to be on the left channel and the guest is going to be on the right channel. Is that to say that they'd be okay with just mono mixes? Uh, the only one that needed serial mixes was the band. Okay, perfect. So, so all the IFBs can be used, and and what I initially thought is that uh, in the main hall there would be a left host and a right guest on a total of four different uh, IFB channels. Uh, so they could have some extra mixes in there depending on how they wanted to do that. And then in the breakout rooms, each breakout room only needs one mono IFB. Uh, but I figured they they would probably be shared each each two channel unit would be shared between two rooms next to each other. So they be and they'd just be on whips near the rooms. So yeah, gotcha. Um, so what I was thinking here uh, for this uh, main hall A, the wireless for the convention, since each host or guest really only needs one. Uh, channel there, one mix, a mono mix, we really only need, I think, two PSM boxes yep. Yep. because they're, they're two channels. So we'll have left of channel one goes to the host, right of channel one goes to the guest, left of channel two goes to another host or another guest, and right of channel two goes to another host or another guest. Um, so in that case, what we'd be doing is asking for two frequencies and then for any given channel, like channel one, for example, that could be split into two mono mixes. So that'll save us a little bit of spectrum there. Um, just another way to, to help make it easy on us. Um, for everything else, yeah, the mic channels look pretty straightforward. IEMs will do stereo. And then for IFB, again, yeah, we could do mono here. Um, because we're not gonna really wanna split four, uh, four mono mixes across four rooms because that box ends up being in one of those four rooms, we'll probably still leave this at 16, which just means that we'll have a couple spare channels on our devices. Just a quick clarification point for the guests that are watching. Um, uh, sometimes GoToWebinar makes the view you're seeing a little awkward. If you grab the gray bar below our webcams and move it up or down, it will expand the screen share uh, visualization versus the camera visualization that might help you might help you see things a little bit better. Just a quick note. Indeed, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That was something that caught me up when I was watching a few of these. Yeah. Also, there there is a Zoom button at the top of your screen, everybody's screen, so you can zoom in on the, on the shared part of the screen if you wanted to and just enlarge it yourself. Look at that. I've been doing these for since the beginning of quarantine, and I never noticed that Zoom button. Thanks, thanks for the knowledge, there, Pete. There we go. Yep, I'm getting <laughs> schooled up right now myself. All right, gonna be webinar pros. All right. Yeah. 
Cool. So um, I'm in Wireless Workbench here. Uh, I've launched version 6.13.2, which is available on Sure.com for free. You can just go to Sure.com slash WWB and it'll redirect you to the product page if you want to follow along at home. So um, now that we know our basic channel counts that we're looking for, and I've got that documented over here in my Excel file, uh, I'm going to go over to uh, our other file here in our tech specs that the team shared just to take a look and, and show you the, the logic that we're going to be using here. So we've got a feature in Wireless Workbench called RF Zones, which is really good for coordinating in separate spaces. And so the layout that we're going to use here is we're going to treat this Hall A, our show here, where we're going to have our convention mics, we're going to have some entertainment mics for a band. We're going to treat that as a zone unto itself. And it's pretty large, 250 feet by 350 feet. So that in and of itself constitutes roughly uh, one zone. Uh, this other zone over here that's a different show has nothing to do with our convention, we'll also treat as a separate zone. And in fact, uh, Peter gave us this in uh, the Excel file that shows that we've got these other devices that are being operated. So we've got some Sennheiser G3 uh, IEMs and we've got some Sennheiser 2000 uh, wireless microphone systems. So uh, with these devices, uh, we want to be able to account for those uh, in a separate place, but they're not really being coordinated. They're being coordinated around with our systems. So if I go back to uh, this diagram here as well, uh, as Peter mentioned, we've got eight breakout rooms on floor one and floor two on the west side and eight breakout rooms uh, on the east side, both floor one and floor two. So uh, we're really just going to treat the west side as, um, or, sorry, west side as one zone and the east side as a different zone. Or another way to think about it is that we can split floor one and floor two into separate zones and then just swap those on the other side. So all the frequencies that we're going to use on floor one on the west side are going to be duplicated on floor two on the east side. And that'll uh, keep some of our spectrum open and make our coordination a little bit more straightforward. So one of the things that I'm going to start with is just going to the tools menu here and managing our RF zones. Uh, and we start with a default zone because anything that you coordinate has to be in some physical area. But um, since that's an immutable zone, we're just going to create some new ones here for ourselves. Uh, and I'll name one Hall A. That's where uh, our convention mics and our band mics are going to be. But then I'll also have breakout rooms for uh, floor one and it can have breakout rooms for floor two. And remember, again, we're gonna duplicate these frequencies in another area. So um, there really is no need to create separate zones for those, uh, those other devices. We can, um, some would argue we should, but I don't find it necessary. And then the last one would be hall B, and that's where we kept uh, the frequencies that are not part of our show. So uh, now that we've got our zones, uh, at least input into our list, we should talk about the relationships between them. So in this matrix here in the configure tab of the RF zone manager, you can set what the relationship is between any two zones. So this default one, since we're not using it, I'm actually just gonna clear all of the checkboxes on them. But for hall A, let's talk about that as our convention hall and our entertainment. Really, we've got breakout rooms on both sides of it. And um, even though those breakout rooms on either side may not interact with one another, they are still just a hallway away from our convention microphones. So I'm going to go ahead and set those to treat it like we're basically in the same zone. So it's going to take into account the channel spacing of the device and the intermodulation spacing uh, of those uh, that are produced by the frequencies that are in use as well. Um, and then this hall B, I suppose I should have clarified that with Peter too. Is this in the same building, Peter? Uh, yes, right. it's it's basically on the same floor as Hall A, but okay. behind but behind Hall A. So uh, the, and their stage is back to back with the stage in in Hall A. So okay, 
So maybe in that case, we also want to treat this as though they're close enough that we might even get some intermod products coming from them. So basically, Hall A is saying, I'm connected to everybody. It's the most stringent type of relationship that you can have with these other zones. Um, for the breakout rooms, however, we're going to leave this relationship with Hall A, and we're going to say breakout room on floor one. We're going to uh, disconnect from uh, floor two, the intermod products. So that basically says that any intermods that are generated by the frequencies in a given zone, in zone uh, breakout floor one, aren't really going to make them their presence known in floor two. But the channel to channel spacing, because it's you know top to bottom and we're not cer certain what the material is between the floors, maybe we wanna just account for the channel to channel spacing there. Um, and then for hall B, since it's on the same floor, um, but further away, we're gonna treat this basically like it's another breakout room and say that we're not concerned with the hall B here. Um, and for breakout two, it's the same sort of relationship. Hall A, we care about um, the breakout with uh, floor one. We wanna make sure that we're accounting for the channel to channel spacing. But then on hall B, again, far enough away that maybe we don't need to be concerned with it. So now that we've set up our relationships, our zones are set. There are a couple of launch points that we can go to from here, um, whether you like to start by documenting what your environment looks like, meaning what's the scan data, what are the TV channels, but personally, I like to concern myself with what's the equipment that I'm going to be using. And that sort of helps keep track for me uh, of all the things, all the devices, the physical equipment that I'm gonna end up using. It also has the added benefit that when I'm working in the inventory here, um, if I were actually connected to my network devices, those devices would automatically populate in this list, whether they were a microphone system, an in-ear monitor system, or what have you. Um, since I'm not connected, this is a lot like we're coordinating a show ahead of time. And this will help us do a bit of band planning. It'll help us figure out what frequency bands we want to get. So when you're working with that sort of workflow, staging uh, a coordination ahead of time for equipment that you will more than likely put on the network, I like to create the virtual devices in the inventory so that when I do plug in my systems, I can drag and drop the rows of the offline devices or the virtual ones that we're about to create onto the rows of the network devices that are online. And it'll prompt me and say, which parameters do you want to take? The virtual parameters or the online parameters? And we could take the virtual one. So really we're just staging this coordination or we're going to end up like pasting it on top of the real devices once they actually come online. Um, alternatively, for those who have no intention of networking directly to devices, you can use this sidebar over here to basically add the same devices and parameters directly into coordination. The downside is that when you go to assign and deploy, there won't be any channels to actually deploy to. So it's really however you like to approach your coordination. But for today, we're gonna start in the inventory. So we've got our, uh, our zone set up and we know exactly what devices we need. So we'll just go ahead and start adding them. I'll reference my Excel file here and I'm just gonna work my way from top to bottom. So we've got our uh, Axiant digital system in the G57 band and we're gonna need six frequencies of that. And since it's all in the same space, you could do either a quad and a dual or you can do three duals uh, to get the frequencies you want. I'm just going to do three duals. Uh, Those are gonna actually need... going to be in frequency diversity, so each each channel needs two frequencies. Oh, okay. So what you're saying here then is that we would need double that. We're going to need Correct. 12 frequencies. Okay, perfect. Correct. Correct. Yeah. That's good to know. So we'll take uh, the dual in the G57, and we know that's going to go into Hall A. I'll leave it at uh, the standard transmission mode as opposed to to high density and we can worry about that later if it comes into to conflict uh, but pete says we want 12 channels or 12 frequencies really so we'll add six devices here i think it's important here you were just talking about the workflow situation that um, because we put our zones in ahead of time they exist in that drop down menu when adding to the inventory 
So that was a selection that we made based on not maybe trying to do this in advance. Um, mm -hmm. If you were to plug in your gear and have it all populated in inventory, you could totally make your zones afterwards and then assign them either the via the coordination page or the inventory page, just like, as you can see, Corey doing here is another way to do that. But That's uh, there's correct. kind of multiple ways to, to create this workflow. This is just going to be uh, one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for clarifying that. So yeah, you could double click on a row here and choose from one of the zones that you've already created. Or if you wanted to deploy to multiple devices, you could select them or multiple channels, select them into uh, the inventory and then choose your zone from here and then press apply to deploy that to the systems. So uh, these devices as well, since they're gonna be in frequency coordination, uh, or sorry, frequency diversity mode, we're going to want to go to the properties panel of this device and we're going to go to the radio tab and set its frequency diversity mode. So we'll put it in selection mode because this is going to be a combo wireless, meaning we're, we might use body pack, we might use handheld uh, at any given point. So once we do that, I've set that for my first device. And this is where managing your inventory really comes into play and could be very, very handy. So um, this combo wireless here is for our convention microphones. What I'll do is I'll set the name of this thing so I recognize these devices for what they're supposed to be. Um, so we can call this like combo wireless and then um, auto enumerate from zero one. So when I apply that, what you'll see is that each of the devices, which are two channels a piece, now get named accordingly. So I've got this one device called CW zero one for example the same thing is true of the channel names which we can come back to later uh, but just uh, quick enough to let me know that my device ids are the same but if i wanted to do it for the channel name for example i could call this um, again same thing if i wanted to combo wireless zero one and that becomes the name of it um, when you're auto enumerating a thing to pay attention to is that um, when you give it some name and you choose auto enumerate, uh, whether it's the channel name or device ID, you've got eight characters. And in order to pad it so that it, um, you've got the zero pad, you'll want to put that into the field. And if it happens that you have, say, a hundred channels, for example, you might want to do a double zero pad. That way, when you deploy it, it recognizes that it's going to end up having three uh, three characters at the end and deploys that accordingly. So now we can move a little bit faster. Now that we've got our Axiant Digital in place, uh, the next thing we wanted are our PSM 1000s. So, oh, Pete, looks like you're chiming in. Yeah, we had a, a question uh, uh, asking what what are Corey's cool presets for AD4 in WW. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. So presets are just a really cool way of um, taking all the parameters that are, are possible in this sidebar and staging them and saying that I want to keep this as a, a favorite so that it's very easy for me to just add a new device of a given class. What we're looking at here right now are my Axiom digital presets, um, and I've only got four of them. They've got X amount of parameters here available. Uh, to send, and when I press apply, it will send those parameters to the device, whether it's virtual or online. We see this used a lot if you're if you're a monitor engineer and you're coming to a rack of PSMs that you know you got from a rental house. If you have a certain set of parameters that you always use in terms of uh, of gain or power setting, you you walk into a venue and a lot of people will just immediately change their racks to a specific setting as a as a global starting point that they're used to. You can save that preset in your workbench file when you plug it in select all those, highlight them, apply presets, and you just reprogrammed your entire rack to those presets that you're comfortable with working at, or at least starting at. Um, so it's a big time saver and you can, there's a, a lot of options in those presets. So great question. And uh, thanks for thanks for having Corey's cool presets in there, Corey. <laughs> you got it, man. 
Um, so I'm also going to change how I order um, my inventory here. Right now, you can see that these dark gray headers are by the microphone, or sorry, the system type. I'm going to change that to RF zone. So when we populate these, we can see that they're actually going into the appropriate zone. So the next thing we had up were uh, two channels of PSM for IFB in the G10 band. So we can scroll down to PSM 1000, G10. We're also going to put that in Hall A, and we only needed the two channels because we're going to use that in mono mode. So that gives us uh, basically everything that we needed for the, the convention wireless, uh, something I imagine to be uh, the PA system for making announcements or communicating things. Uh, to the convention as a whole. Next, for entertainment in the same hall, we've got some UHFR, ULXD, and PSM 1000. So we've got four, four, and eight channels, respectively, of those. So we'll go to Sure. We'll look for UR4D. And we want J5 going also into Hall A. And we needed four channels of that. So that's two devices. We can add that. Next was ULXD in either H50 or G50, um, you know, for the time being, why not just do both? So we'll look for ULXD and we needed four channels. So maybe I'll do a two channel box in G50 and a two channel box in H50 as well. Oh, didn't mean to close that window. Um, the next thing we need is PSM in the J8 band. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, our frequency band conversion tool, it's something that we offered as a result of the 600 megahertz spectrum auction. Um, we offered a, uh, a way to convert your existing J8 band into the J8A. So if I hover over one of these devices, you could see that my J8s used to tune or would tune from 554 to 626, excluding that TV channel 37 band that's for uh, radio astronomy and medical telemetry. Once you convert it through software, it was a permanent change to change it to 554 to 616. Again, still excluding TV channel uh, 37. Um, instead of creating this uh, J8 band and then creating uh, another exclusion that tries to keep it out of the spectrum that's no longer legal, I'm just gonna go ahead and add this new system, right? Because we haven't gotten any of our gear, we haven't ordered it yet, we're just really band planning for this system. Uh, so we can afford to say, um, you know, we're gonna plan for these eight channels of the J8A band uh, instead. You kind of brushed over that, but that's a really cool feature uh, for you to determine or figure out what band a certain piece of gear operates in. Um, if you hover over it in that inventory page, it will show you just like he did um, for multiple multiple vendors um, RF <laughs> uh, where where their band lies, right? So um, there you go. There's block 20. If you if somebody came up and said, hey, I need something between 518 and 537. Well, what block is that? They don't know. You can go in here and use that as a tool to figure that out if you don't have that information available to you. Right. Cool. So these PSMs I accidentally put in my default band. So this is a good opportunity to show that I can still move those back over to hall A um, and it updates accordingly. So that takes care of our Hall A. And what we'll see is that in Hall A, we've got 30 total frequencies that we're working with. So also good um, as a feature there in Wireless Workbench to show you how many frequencies or devices you're expecting in that area. What's up, Pete? Do you uh, take into account any power settings on these at all? Uh, I got a, Harry McCann says, can you confirm RF power and its coordination? I've always been of the opinion that there is not a high power option, WWB, will by default take into account a high power transmit, so coordinations won't affect the plot. Yeah, that is an excellent question. So in Wireless Workbench, we don't take into account the power as part of the coordination. And that's because uh, the actual power, the received power, Workbench has no way of knowing what that will be. And um, 
you almost don't either unless you're measuring it both at your transmit and receive point. Um, you know, 30 milliwatts of transmit power is a lot different when you're 150 feet away versus when you're 50 feet away. And so what we coordinate for is really um, what we'll see when we get into the coordination are the spacing parameters that we allow for, not only between uh, channel to channel um, interaction, so your primary frequency versus another primary frequency, but also the relationship between that primary frequency that you're looking for and the intermods that could result from it or any other signals that are in your spectrum. Because we can't control distance, um, that's just not something that's part of this mathematical calculation. But it's a great question. So I'll move on to uh, the breakout rooms here. So for each of the breakout rooms, we need four ULXD and we need one channel of IFB from a PSM 1000. So we're gonna start by working on floor one. And in floor one, we've got eight rooms, but we can concern ourselves with the rooms in a moment. We're looking for ULXD. And again, because we're looking for four channels, you can choose either four singles or um, uh, a couple duals or a quad receiver. It's really your choice. Uh, because um, we might end up using a mix of bands here and we wanna be kinda all over the place, um, not knowing what our spectrum is gonna be like just yet, I'm gonna opt for single channel receivers because those can always be uh, mounted in the rack side by side to make up the 19 inches uh, and that'll give us ultimate flexibility also if we want to walk some of those units around. Additionally so, you could you could move a single frequency via your zones as that changes mm -hmm. um, if it, so uh, if it's locked to a quad you have less flexibility as you're trying to manipulate these these numbers later on so right. it's a good place to start if you don't know um, even if you do have quads and you're not plugging them in uh, to see the network, you can apply, uh, you know, those in batches of four. So, Absolutely. Um, another good thing to note with respect to zones is that, just as an example, and I'll add this here really quickly um, into my default zone, when I add a quad unit, all of those frequencies have to go to the same zone. So you see when I move that quad, this whole box yep. comes along. Exactly. So we don't want that to happen necessarily, just in case we want to have some flexibility to move around our frequencies. So I'm just going to opt to create a bunch of single channel devices. So we've got our ULXD, the four, which is our single. And uh, since we've got four different bands to work with, the V50, which is in the VHF band, the G50, H50, and J50A, which will be in the UHF band, um, I'm going to add uh, 16 of each of those. So 64 divided by the four bands that we'll use in each place will be 16. And because we're going to be in such a small area, I, I forget the dimensions here, but I feel like they were 35 feet away from one another. Yeah, 35 by 75 is the size of the room. Yeah, so this width here, these are pretty close and uh, the equipment is relatively close to the antennas as well. We can make an assumption that we don't need a whole bunch of output power from our transmitters here. And so I can switch this to high density mode. And that basically says it's gonna change the modulation mode of the system a little bit so that it treats its, uh, its occupied bandwidth as a narrower signal. Um, and it also caps what its RF output power will be. So this makes it so that I can stack a bunch of frequencies side by side, 200 kilohertz away from one another with no uh, intermods being generated between them. So that really saves us a lot of spectrum. So I'm just gonna repeat this for each of those four bands that I need. I've got my G50 here. I'll drop down to H50 and make sure that that's also in HD mode. I'll go to J50A and you'll notice I'm choosing J50A instead of J50 for the exact same reason as we just discussed on the PSM. It's that frequency band conversion. Um, originally this device would tune from 572 to 636 and when we permanently converted that to make sure that it would be 
compliant in the United States, we just truncate it at 616 so it doesn't occupy the rest of that 20 megahertz that is no longer compliant. What and this also I was just going to say, Jason. as as of Monday, uh, that is a must a must do as well. We've reached mm -hmm. the end of this auction period, so absolutely. Yeah. So I'll add my J50A as well, and then the last one that we had was a V50. And we'll add 16 of those. So when I go to my breakout, I look out breakout floor one, and this is going to have G50, H50, J50A, and V50. So again, this is a time where I'm gonna wanna um, start naming things just so that once we do get into our coordination and we start looking at specific fields that are going to reference these devices that we've made, it's gonna be a lot easier to track for us. So the devices, these are all, again, single channel devices. Um, I'm probably just going to borrow the name from the uh, the zone and call this breakout. Um, this will be floor number one, and we're going to auto enumerate um, since we've got how many channels was that? 64, right? 64. Yeah. Um, we'll pad with at least one zero, and when I apply that for the device ID, it'll auto enumerate all of those so we can keep track of them. The same is true for um, the channel name, and again. I'm not very creative with the names right now, and you might have your own nomenclature that you'd like to use, but I'm just trying to keep it really simple here. Um, so we'll just give it the same name, and we can customize those things later. But when I apply this, what you'll see is that all of these start updating um, in, the, in my inventory. So this will make it easier for me to track. And then once I actually print out a coordination report, um, whether the frequencies were deployed directly to the hardware or if someone's walking around with a sheet and doing this manually from the front panel, they know exactly which device needs which frequency. So basically, we're going to repeat what we did just I, now for breakout I, one. When I did this, I assumed that all of the, uh, the venue is wired up with network, so everything can be networked together. Perfect. So that's a really good point. If if you had all of this networked, all of your channel names throughout your entire venue would have just changed as well. If it was live and you were networked, you would have just renamed every single channel of wireless uh, from those breakout rooms as quick as he just changed that. So uh, network your wireless. <laughs> Absolutely. Makes things a lot easier. You may be asking, how would I know if it's online or not? Um, what you'll see is in the bottom right corner, this will tell you whether your network is active. You can just click on that button and it'll tell you which ac um, which network interface you're currently connected to on your computer. And then for devices that are actually discovered online, you'll see that information uh, on the left-hand side here as a gray bar. Um, so yeah, we're gonna repeat what we did for floor one and basically do the same thing on floor two. Oh, I forgot uh, our PSM in that area. So we wanted half G10, half J8. So we need 16 total. We'll just do eight of each in our breakout. So we've got G10 in floor one, and we'll do eight channels. And then we'll do our J8A as well, eight channels. And now we can go ahead and duplicate for our second. So ULXD, G50, floor two, high density mode, 16 channels. And we'll do the same thing for H50, setting it to HD, our J50A in HD, and lastly, our V50 in HD. Then we do our PSM, we need G10, with eight channels, and J8A with eight channels. Cool, and that comprises all of our inventory that we're gonna have in our main hall and breakouts here, but we've also got this hall B wireless to deal with. So how do we account for systems that are not sure um, in wireless workbench? There are a couple ways to do it. Um, one way is to 
go into the add new devices dialog again in the top left corner. We can choose Sennheiser and just find the system. So we've got a G3 IEM, uh, and I forget which band this was in, uh, the A band. And it looks like there are six of those. So do two, three, four, yep. five, six. Yep. And that's going into hall B this time. So that's not our equipment. And then we also wanted our 2000 system. Am I correct that the EM is the receiver? Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's all over. Yep. Cool. And that's in the G band. And that had 12. 12 of those. Okay. So we'll have 12 channels of that. Cool. And now when I scroll down to hall B, way down here at the bottom, we'll see that our Sennheiser uh, have been added to our list as well. So you've got a couple options for how to populate the frequencies here. Um, there's the more manual way, and there's a way that's a little bit less manual. I'll just put it that way. Uh, the manual way is I can double click the uh, frequency column, which by default, all of these devices start with bind best. That's just a um, legacy way of us saying, um, when you coordinate, find the best frequency, um, which we would do anyway. Um, so I could double click and I could add the frequency from here, or choose it from the drop down list but I've already got them here and I'm prone to fat fingering things a lot. So uh, <laughs> there is a way to import some of these frequencies um, and it requires a spreadsheet. Good thing I've got one. So I can just choose these first uh, G3. And what you're gonna wanna do is segment these by the model and band of the device that you've got. But let's just copy these. I'll create a new Excel spreadsheet. I'll paste them into column A um, and that's really all I need, but I'm going to save this as a file. And I'll put it on my desktop again so I don't lose it. And this will be our Sennheiser G3 frequencies. And I'll put it in the CSV format. And then I can do the same thing after I close that one for our 2000 series. I'll copy them, create a new Excel spreadsheet, paste them into column A, and then save this as Sennheiser 2000, and then make that a CSV. So now what I've just done is I've made it a very easily readable file for wireless workbench to choose that stuff. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go over into my frequency coordination tab, and I'm gonna choose to import frequencies. And you can tell by this dialog that it's asking for a file and then what type of device um, and band and RF profile this thing is gonna have. So first I'll choose the file from my desktop and I'll start with G3. And we find it again in our list of equipment profiles. You go to Sennheiser, G3 IEM in the A band, press okay. So now when I import, it gets brought in successfully. And now it becomes in the list for my coordination, but we're not coordinating just yet. Let's do the uh, 2000 series systems as well. So I find that file, bring it in. That's our G band and I press import. So now what I've done is I brought those six frequencies from G3 and the 12 frequencies from EM2000. Because I created those in the inventory, I now have a target for where those frequencies are gonna go. So when I press assign and deploy, if I go to hall B as the zone, what you'll see is that all of these unassigned channels, the things that I forgot to name, right? And this is why you want to name things in the inventory. These are the channel names of those devices that I created. So what I could do is go down to the left-hand corner, press auto assign, and it's just gonna take those over in some random order and make sure that they are assigned to a frequency. So that when I deploy to the inventory, You'll notice I go back and voila, my frequencies are in the inventory. So a couple extra steps, but for me, I would rather take a little extra time to make sure that I didn't fat finger one of these frequencies. Um, so I'm gonna quickly pause here for a moment. Jason, any questions on, on where we've got so far or do you think I should keep on moving? Uh, there's one question here. Um... Derek Chandler says, could you just copy floor one and rename? I think he's talking about 
the breakout room, since we're reusing yeah. those channels, could you have just copy and pasted um, instead of creating a second set of inventory? Could you have copied from this inventory page and duplicated? Oh, you mean just like copy and then paste the thing? Um, Correct. We've kept out of uh, this notion or the concept of copying and pasting a device, whether it's virtual or networked, because this could have theoretically as far as wireless workbench is concerned this could have been a real device at some point and so to copy and paste it doesn't know what to do with some of the parameters like your uh your ip address so it, the copy and paste isn't a function in this area but uh yes absolutely you could create just your floor one for example and coordinate for that and then following the exact same process that i just did for importing frequencies for Sennheiser systems. Yep. I could create my floor two zone and all of those devices, go to frequency coordination exclusively for those frequencies, have them re-imported according to their device type and then push to it so that you can still view it in the inventory, but you don't have to coordinate for it. Now, since you're planning on sharing frequencies between one side of the building and the other, and mm -hmm. let's say they're all networked, how do you create that second side of the building that's going to have a shared frequencies with the first to push it to the devices? Yeah, a great question. I would follow the exact same process that I did for the Sennheiser units. So mm -hmm. once we get into the coordination part of it, when we're actually starting to calculate, what you'll notice is I'm actually going to omit my floor two. Really, I started by creating everything in the inventory so that there's right. an end target for once those frequencies are generated, I can now start pushing them to those uh, virtual devices. Um, right, right. And for me, that's just a, a, an easier mental process for me to get around. Um, and maybe that's not something that you want to do, but for me, it's just, I'm slow sometimes, guys. So as, as explicit as I can be, it okay. makes my life easier. John Sulik asks, uh, could, when you import to the CSV, it looks like they automatically get locked. Mm -hmm. Or do you lock those? Uh, they do automatically get locked. So this concept of locking basically means that um, it is a locked frequency request. If you have a frequency anywhere in this space, this coordination workspace, we call it, when you hit calculate, if it's unlocked, it's requesting a new frequency. If it's locked, it won't. So when I hit calculate here, it's immediately going to stop and say, nope, never mind, you're not doing anything with this. Um, and that's purely because, uh, you know, we, we've said hold on to exactly what is here um, and for those asking why this is showing up as incompatible is because i don't yet have the parameters of wireless workbench configured to how that calculation was done once i set those parameters accordingly assuming we have that data that that's when you'll start seeing this show up as compatible but it shows up incompatible now and because this is our not our equipment we frankly don't care about it right now um, but yeah, so going back to uh, the inventory, we've got everything that we need here. So I think we are ready to start bringing things into the coordination workspace. I'm gonna leave these frequencies here. Um, to bring in devices into the inventory, I go to select frequencies from inventory on the right-hand side here. And I can either choose to bring in everything uh, from the inventory, everything from the inventory and the CFL, which is also called the coordinated frequency list. That's ba that basically says, if I've done a coordination already and it's stored in wireless workbench, then this frequency list tool will already have that information for me. And I want to bring that in too. Could also be that I have an AXT 600 spectrum manager online and that contains a coordination as well. And so I would bring that in. But really what we wanna do here is be kind of selective about what we're bringing in. So we're gonna bring in things um, by zone. So our inventory channels are here. Um, we've got hall B in there. Or actually, yeah, we've already brought in hall B, so I can just select all from inventory and that'll capture everything else. So that'll take a moment. Cool. And you'll remember what I said is I don't really wanna take anything from uh, B, so I can actually delete all of these here. Or sorry, not hall B, uh, breakout floor two. Cool. So as a total, 
we can see in the lower right hand corner of this table that at the end of it, we're looking for 128 primary frequencies. The bands, um, for those interested and in where that uh, they end up on the spectrum, you'll also see that in the spectrum plot here up above. Um, and you see a little uh, glimpse of that at the top too. So these are the frequencies we're working with. Okie doke. So now we wanna bring in our scan data. So what we found were some uh, CSVs or what were given to us were these CF, uh, CSV files that were, uh, I'm assuming, generated by a TTI scanner. Is that right? That's correct. No numbers, I don't wanna update right now. We'll go back to Excel. I'm not a fan of numbers, guys. Um, so when we look at this file and we open it up uh, in the CSV format, let me zoom in here, we'll notice that we've got uh, some header information here. And this is stuff that Wireless Workbench doesn't know what to do with. So we wanna get rid of it. But everything from row 18 and beyond, um, and I think, yeah, even at the bottom, just row 18 and beyond is all the stuff that we wanna keep. So all you gotta do is strip one through 17, delete those rows, and resave it, and now you can import those uh, those CSV files into Wireless Workbench. I already went ahead and did that, um, creating all these underscore stripped versions. So I stripped the headers out of them uh, just to save a little bit of time. I didn't bring them into Workbench, so I'll have to do that now. Uh, but we're going to start with the outside scans, and we'll just work our way up from the low side. You see, as I bring them in, they just start populating. That's number seven. Can you select multiple ones with the holding down the command key or control? Uh, your... At present, no, but expect that as an update. The header, the header information varies depending on what scanner you're using, but the general idea is the same. If you get it into a CSV in Excel, You'll want to remove basically anything that isn't just the uh, the scan data there, as you can see Corey showing that on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and so what so you'll end up with, uh, sorry, oh, Jason, is that's uh, right. Go your, ahead. Your frequency on the left hand side and your RSSI in DBM on the right side. Cool. So now we've got all of our outside scans brought in here. And uh, some may argue, like, we want to bring in our TV channels to um, using this uh, TV channels database that we have. But I find that the scan data is more representative of actually what you're going to encounter. In the absence of having scan data, absolutely use the TV channel scan, uh, TV channel database to enter your location either in lat long coordinates or in uh, a postal code to try and narrow it down to where you're operating. Um, but we've got scan data here. And what you can see, I'm gonna start hiding some of the stuff on the plot here, like our, our frequencies that we're asking for. So that when I zoom in here, this uh, very, very light blue overlay that I have is showing where our exclusion data is located. It's basically saying, if this scan data that I brought in exceeds this red threshold, um, our exclusion threshold, which you can also see on the right-hand side here. If it exceeds that threshold, mark it as an excluded part of the spectrum. The energy is too hot, don't put a frequency there. And while we're at it, since we're talking about thresholds, another one to pay attention to is the orange threshold. This scan peak threshold says that if ever you've got scan data that exceeds that threshold, Treat it like it's some kind of transmitter, not just like a TV transmitter, but this might even be close enough to be another microphone system. So we've got default parameters that we give this. So out of the box or fresh from download, what you'll notice is that the profile for this, if you hover over this rhombus at the top here, it'll tell you that this is a generic device that produces IMDBs and it is a wideband device. So it could be anywhere. Um, and it's currently transmitting on such and such frequency. But we may know this to be something else. It could just be an excessive TV transmitter. 
we may know it to be one of our own transmitters or something else, um, and so that we don't want to account for it. Because this generic device, IMD, um, is such a, a spectrum hog, we might want to give it a different profile or just ignore it entirely. So if you want to see what those profiles are and what the spacing parameters are like, you can go to tools and then equipment profiles and find what it is that you're looking for. Um, so ours was a generic, generic device IMD wideband. If we look at its um, filtering and intermods tab, we can see here that it's channel to channel spacing, regardless of our compatibility level, meaning how uh, strict we want to be with the spacing from more robust to providing more frequencies. It's channel to channel spacing is 800 kilohertz. That's huge. Now, that's great if you're not trying to get 128 frequencies or um, if you really have no idea what the signal is and want to be as cautious as possible. But for us, this looks like it's sitting in the middle of a DTE channel. Um, and even though that's spread out there, um, the DTV channel at more than 800 megahertz. It really is just noise in my system. So I'm just going to go ahead and ignore it from the system. That basically important. says. Hmm? Yeah, important distinction here. It doesn't ignore it in terms of the red exclusion threshold line. You're just ignoring it in terms of giving it a profile and, and including those IMD, IMDBs basically that you saw in that profile. So you can see that it's still excluding that space based on the red line, it's just mm -hmm. not now excluding what would be the profile attributes to that unit. That's correct, yeah, and an important distinction to make. And if ever you needed to find that again, you could go back in and look for uh, single frequency exclusions, which are typically the things that uh, exceed the scan peak threshold. And if I just check this again and press save, it'll put that back into my plot. Um, the same thing I'm expecting is true of that other frequency uh, exclusion that we just saw here. So let me zoom back out. That was in the 470 range. Yeah, so this is actually looking like a microphone transmitter. And truthfully, I don't know who that is. So it's probably good that we give it its wide berth. Um, but I don't think it needs to be that wide. Um, we could treat this as some other system. I don't know what necessarily to treat it as but I'm just gonna go ahead and choose something uh, nonetheless. Um, let's change yeah. its profile. And we'll say that this one is still um, capable of producing IMD, uh, but it's probably just a generic exclusion. You can see, so yeah, yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so that'll treat it like a single frequency, but not with its spacing parameters as well. So that channel to channel doesn't matter anymore, but this thing is capable of producing intermods in the spectrum. So it's kind of a middle ground there, not saying that it's this monstrous signal out there, but it's also something that we should be concerned about. In a perfect world, we're re-coordinating these frequencies we find on a space, right? If you're if you're really diligent about finding every frequency, but if there is something that shows up like this in your scan and you 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 don't have the time or the resources or you just can't track it down, this is a really good way to to let Wireless Workbench manage that for you without being able to move that if you don't have the control to do so uh, at whatever site you're at. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So now that we've got that all set up, uh, we've got our scan data in here. There's a couple things you could do. One is just to go ahead and calculate for things and see what happens. So when you hit calculate, anytime you hit calculate, what happens is that the calculator grabs a random frequency and throws it out and finds out if it's compatible given all of the constraints, all of the inputs that we've just put into this calculator. And if it's compatible, it'll mark it as green and then it'll move on to another random frequency. Again, taking into consideration all of the constraints that includes what types of what types of frequencies that you ask for. Is this a PSM versus a ULXD? Is it um, a G3 versus a 2000 series? Um, and it'll iterate through that according to how many times you've told it to um, and it'll try and get as far as you can get. So you can see without having done a whole lot of tweaking already, we've gotten 111 out of 128 of those frequencies. And we can stop right now because that might chug for a little bit longer. 
um, and still have a little trouble coming up with some of these other frequencies. For those so, of you unfamiliar, at the bottom there was a progress bar, and it was still it was still thinking, and it would take uh, I don't know how long do you think it would take for it to finish there, Corey? That's it a good take question. Time. Yep. So, um, sorry, I went a little too quick. There's this uh, coordination settings button here, and the frequency coordination tab, or if you just go to the application preferences, it gets you to the same thing to go to the coordination tab. Either way you access it, it's the same info. Um, but down here, you have what's called the uh, max number of passes. So this is how many times is it going to go through a coordination and come to a failure before, um, or sorry, how many times is it going to go through a coordination period to find solutions? Um, and then you could set what's the maximum number of fruitless experiments. So how many times is it supposed to fail to find all the frequencies before it gives up? And this is just a way for you to set your own tolerance. You might say like, yeah, run it until you actually figure it out, which, you know, the truth is there are some coordinations that can't be done, which is why you want to set some sort of reasonable threshold. I tend to leave mine at like 10,000 and 1,000 because I feel there's always a little bit of tweaking that I can do to make things uh, a little bit uh, clearer for the calculator to understand how to calculate something. Um, but you can you could set it how you see fit. So um, to answer your question, Jason, how much longer would that have run? Maybe another 35, 45 seconds or something like yeah. that. Um, and we just ended up with maybe an extra frequency, but not worth my extra 35 or 45 seconds. So um, what are the tools that you have available to you when you find yourself not coming up with enough frequencies? We've talked about a few of them already, and we've taken steps for a few of them already you could um, change the profile of anything that's detected as a scan peak. We've talked about the thresholds, which are movable, um, but since I've got this really high noise floor over here in this spectrum, even though the majority of my devices aren't there, I'm kind of assuming that we don't really want to um, raise or lower this threshold. So I'll use that as a last resort if we're really struggling for frequencies. because It's also kind of in the above 600 megahertz area. Yeah, that's very true. So um, that, that yeah. big one sticking up, I think, is T-Mobile. Ah, uh, this guy here. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Lovely. That's a a glimpse into the future, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get used to it. Um, so really, if we're looking at um, what we've got available, we don't have TV channel thirty-seven. Uh, available to us, that's uh, radio astronomy and medical telemetry. You can kind of see that by looking at these uh, frequency band overlays here. This dark gray blotch is letting you know that this device is incapable of tuning there. But another way to show that to us and to make sure that the calculator um, knows that we're not operating in some country where that is available, for example, is I can just right click on TV 37 and choose exclude and now I get this lovely red overlay. Um, and you can change the color of those overlays as well. So if I wanted this to be uh, hot pink, for example, I could do that too. Um, Comes in handy if you're, if you're aware of TV channels in a space and the data is not accurate of that. If we did bring in a zip code, if you know 14 and 18 are TV channels, but for some reason they're not reflective of our uh, import uh, zip code function. You can also just right click down there and add them. Or um, if you know if your scan, if you, if the data is showing that there's a TV channel there and your scan is showing there isn't, you can also just right click on that TV channel on the bottom and exclude it. Yeah. Yep. And uh, the reverse works too. So if I wanted to bring it back, I can right click and bring it back too. Yep. Cool. Um, so one more thing is this J5 here um, because uh, UHFR is a discontinued product and doesn't quite have the same software that some of our more modern sure devices have. It wasn't privy to the same um, conveniences that things like ULXD and PSM were to create these truncated bands. So we're going to want to account for this and make sure that it doesn't go any further than it's supposed to. And we can do that by creating what's called an inclusion group. And that's much like or the inverse of an exclusion saying we're not to put stuff it's where you want things to be put so we can say for our j5 for example 
we can go to inclusions uh, in the spectrum tab hit the gear and this dialog pops up you check account for inclusion lists then manage and we're just going to create a list doesn't matter what you call the list but we'll call this our, our mega convention and you'll want to create a group in here. A group is um, now for this mega convention, I could have several different groups. I'm going to create one for the J5 to truncate it to the legal spectrum, but I could create another one maybe later. And this is one of the tools that we might come back to, to say, I specifically want to put my PSM over here because it's not going to overlap with my other systems. Uh, but we'll make this our UR in the J5A band. So when you select it and choose it, we now have to choose what frequencies it's going to be. Um, and I forget UHFR offhand, so I'll put something in here because I can't recall and save it for a second. But let me check again on those UHFRs. Oh, so it's 578, and we'll bring it up to 616, and it's automatically going to exclude the uh, TV37. So 578 is our low end frequency. So when I save that, to save, you notice I've got this inclusion groups overlay here. Um, I could turn this on and off so you could see it. It's this white overlay that comes up and shows that's where anything that gets added to this inclusion group is only going to get a frequency request for. So even though this J5 band extends out here, it's only allowed or will only be allowed to be put in there. So because we created devices in the inventory, um, there are two ways to add something to an inclusion group. And one is directly from the coordination workspace. However, if you do this, you've now created this disjointed target. You said that in the coordination workspace, it's supposed to have an inclusion group, but its device doesn't, so that when you go to assign and deploy, it doesn't work. So instead of doing that here, what we're gonna do is delete our J5, go to the inventory, find our J5. There we go, our four frequencies. And we're gonna change this inclusion group. So we're doing this in batches. We'll go over to the right sidebar and choose inclusion group, URJ5A, and press apply. That way, when we bring it back in, it'll also be tagged accordingly. So we can select frequencies from inventory, manually select, and we'll find our J5 or our UR4. And we'll take these four channels. Press OK, and that brings them back in here. So what you'll notice, and it's kind of confusing, so I maybe uh, should mention here, what you see in these headers is the device model or the device family name, the band that it corresponds to, and it could be appended with some other information to describe the type of frequency request that you've made. So for ULXD, we've got standard here. That's its transmission mode. Same thing for Axiom Digital. For UHFR, it just so happens that since we've added it to an inclusion group, that we append the inclusion group to it. And that's just a way of identifying that if I created additional UR5, URs in the J5A band or the J5 band, they're of a different type and they're of a different frequency request. So cool, now we've got everything um, back in here. Oops, looks like I've misplaced my... Uh... I think we deleted them because they're the we're copying them from A, right? Oh no, I'm sorry, I, I misplaced my hard um, Bs. I see. Yeah, so because we haven't done a coordination, I'm just gonna hit from inventory again, that's gonna bring everything back for me. And now I'll delete from breakout two. Okay, so now we're back to our 128 requests. So 
You might think that the inclusion group is going to help you get more frequencies, but that's not always the case because what you're saying is I'm giving you even further constraints about where you're supposed to put your frequencies. So we've made things a little bit more precarious for us. So when I hit calculate now, odds are um, we'll come up with a, a couple fewer frequencies. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that these are locked again. So I can right click on the header and lock all, and then lock all for those two. And those just get marked green to say like, if you're cool with them, so am I. Question, uh, the UHFR J5s, is there an update for those to uh, change their programming so they won't go into the uh, 600 meg band? There is not. Unfortunately, as a discontinued product um, and having some pretty ancient software uh, relative to what we've got now or firmware in the devices, um, we can't expect an update for UHFR ever again, which is unfortunate to say because it's been oh, such a workhorse for so oh, long. They're, they're not legal to use then. Uh, they are not technically legal to use. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the way bands are. They always bring in illegal equipment. <laughs> well, I won't tell. And uh, John Christie says, don't forget to add backup frequencies. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're not certain yet where we want to add backup frequencies and what's uh, what's not necessarily going to work. So I'm going to start with everything, just assuming I'm going to get my primary frequencies, and then we'll incrementally add some more on top of that. So a couple things that I want to point out about how the calculator works, because this is a little different than some other software applications that you might be using to coordinate frequencies. Um, I've seen it before where you'll add certain devices to certain areas first as a standalone. For example, I might calculate only my UHFRs in the J5 band first. And then once I've locked those frequencies, now I'll grab something else and I'll coordinate those. And then I'll grab another one and I'll coordinate that. Workbench kind of takes care of some of this using a coordination order. So you'll know you're in your default order when this icon here has the green check box or check mark on it. That's your coordination order. If it's not green and you click it, it'll turn green and reset you to the coordination order. To find what your default coordination order is, you can go back to those coordination preferences and then the coordination order tab. And this will tell you by series or family uh, and by band and by RF profile, what is going to get coordinated first. So in this list, what you'll see is that UH, UHFR UR5 portable receiver will get coordinated before PSM 600, before uh, KCX, before PSM 200, so on and so forth, all the way down until the last thing that you coordinate is a Sennheiser EM3732. Um, that's important because that's how things show up in this list. Um, so it doesn't matter what I add first or last to this list, that's how it shows up in this area. You can modify that by dragging the headers around. So if I wanted UHFR to be last in the list, I jump it right beneath um, AD, and what you'll see is that my coordination order now got modified. Um, but that's important because it's effectively the same sort of thing. The calculator is saying, I have to fulfill as much as I can of UHFR before I move on to PSM. Now, there are modifications that we make to that along the way to try and get you as many frequencies as possible across the gamut. Um, but that is the order that we work in, trying to make sure that we get those frequencies. Generally so, speaking, it's hardest to coordinate first, most flexible last is, is the general idea here. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so UHFR, little older system, it's analog, coordinate that first. PSM has a little bit wider range to work with. Um, and a thing to note as well is that when you put something in an inclusion group, you've necessarily taken it out of its coordination order because you've put some constraint on it. So whatever the inclusion group is, we automatically jump it to the top and it's still part of the default order, but you can move that around as you see fit. If you find some device that transmits 400 megahertz wide, super wide band, and you put an inclusion group on it to make it 398, you may not want that still to be the first one, so you could move it around. But yeah, we go from least agile to most agile device at the bottom. Um, 
So another thing to note um, to try and get us some more frequencies here, let me calculate again so that we've at least got a baseline of how many frequencies we're working with. Um, and this will tell us what sort of, uh, what sort of moves we we'll want to make to get more frequencies. So right now we've got 106 frequencies out of 128. And I'm impatient, so I'm just gonna stop the calculation where it's at and say, all right, that's a good baseline to start working with. Um, I'm gonna put my primary and backup frequencies in there so I can actually see them. You can color these markers either by their compatibility, which is why you see some red markers, you see some green markers. You can also color it by the channel color. So if I had taken the time to put some colors to these things in the inventory, that would have, when I pulled them into the coordination workspace, given the colors to these devices as well. Um, but lastly, you can color by RF zone, which I find particularly helpful sometimes if I just wanna say like, you know what, I'm really having a hard time finding the three frequencies for breakouts on floor one. Let me see where those are at in my spectrum. Um, that's a good way to, um, to distinguish them in the plot. Cool, so we've got a lot of frequencies here already, and then we've got a couple, um, tools at our disposal to try and find a few more. So this standard profile on the far right side corresponds to the equipment profile for my ULXD. If I look at its equipment profile, my sure ULXD or in the H50 band, if I look at this standard column, what it's telling me it's kind of what it's telling me over here too, with the exception of the channel spacing. But I can see my channel spacing is 350 kilohertz no matter what I do. But depending on my compatibility profile, I might either have a two transmitter third order harmonic of 150 kilohertz, 75 kilohertz, or zero kilohertz. I might just remove it entirely. So um, what I can do is say, you know what, I'm okay with a little bit um, uh, with conserving a little bit of spectrum by, for example, ignoring the two transmitter third order uh, uh, spacing to my channel. I could either do it this way or I can, because I saw that profile, um, choose more frequencies and just see that information updated over here. So a couple different ways. This is just a little bit more granular for zeroing out uh, values if you happen to have. Um, you know, values for each one of these spacing parameters. But since uh, the ULXD in HD mode is pretty straightforward, um, I just set it to more frequencies. These didn't seem to have a problem when finding frequencies, so I'm probably just gonna leave them here for a second. Um, actually, you know what? Why not just set all ULXD to more frequencies? Uh, Question, yes, are, the, are the transmitters being treated differently than the microphones in terms of, of uh, third order? In other words, on the transmitters, are you doing triple beat with those? Uh, so that was the next thing I was going to come to. Excellent question. So if I look at the PSM right now, I can see here that my channel to uh, two transmitter third order and my three transmitter third order both have values here. I'm not yet ready to give up this... Uh, third order harmonic here at two transmitters. That's basically saying, um, ignoring the harmonic that would come from two microphone transmitters being close to one another. I might have those presenters near one another. I, um, anything could happen with those things. Um, so let's leave that one alone for a moment. But the likelihood of having three of them so close that they're gonna generate a harmonic, I kind of just wanna ignore that one. So I'll do the same thing for PSM here. Um, and again, that'll be duplicated for floor two, but let's take a look elsewhere um, where we might care about that too. So if we take our PSMs in hall A, we could do the same thing and ignore those three transmitter third orders. Um, and I know we were having a little bit of trouble finding enough frequencies in hall A as well. So I can set my ULXD and Axiom Digital, for example, to more frequencies to just change what those parameters feel like. Um, and again, because I don't want to stick myself in a hole right now or box myself into specific frequencies, even though I ended up finding a hundred and some odd frequencies already, 
because I'm starting to tweak things, I might just want to leave that open because who knows when, um, when I'm going to find those frequencies again, or am I just occupying this spectrum and making it harder for me to find those frequencies? So I have, uh, I'm just going to hit recalculate instead of locking what's compatible or locking any frequencies other than what's in Hall B. And we can hit calculate again and see if there's any impact to that. Henry Cohen points out that an IM product is not a harmonic. Because you used that word just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, right. That's a good point. It is not a harmonic. It comes from me playing music. I tend to lean on my music terminology even when I shouldn't. Well, maybe you have a lot of IM products in your music. <laughs> it's quite possible. All right. So now we've gotten ourselves back up to 111 just by setting things to more frequencies. So that's how uh, ignoring IMD products uh, is quite possible for you to get more frequencies. But that was just one of the options that we had at our disposal. So again, I'm going to stop the calculation here and see if we can't do some more. So if I were to look at any given zone, for example, let's take our Hall A. These are our purple ones. Kind of all over the place here. We might be able to make some inclusion groups to move things in or out of the range to free up some space. So it looks like Hall B and uh, breakouts are just fine. Why don't we go ahead and lock all of these too? And maybe those extra 17 frequencies would be pretty straightforward. So those are locked. These should still be locked. Yep, okay, great. So now what can we do to find extra frequencies for UHFR, PSM, ULXD, and Axiant Digital. Got a couple options available to us. Um, one that I might start with is um, creating inclusion groups. So let's see where our PSM, or sorry, our Axiant Digital are at. So we're missing a few of these. And they're kind of spread around here. They're going from 493 to 501. Um, and then not quite certain where to put the rest of them. Let's see where our ULXDs are at. Let's just open them all up. So we've got UHFR up in 584. Oh, and a handy thing to note is that if you right click on one of these, you can choose show on plot. And it'll jump the plot there and start flashing it. Um, the inverse also works too. I can grab a marker and say show in table uh, and it'll flash it in the table. So we've got our PSM as well here. Let's see where that's located. It's in TV channel 31. This is in 29. We might be able to consolidate those somewhere. So here's where I would lean on Excel. It's just a spreadsheet to keep track of our band plan. So I'm going to zoom out. And let's see where we've already ignored TV. So it looks like 24, 25, 26, 27 are all occupied for us. Start this at uh, 14, 15. So basically take us up here. And this is really radio astronomy and medical telemetry. Which ones did we say were occupied? 24, 25, 26. It's TV. And we said 32, 34, 35, 36. Okay. So we got a little bit of space in there. 
this looks like it could be TV, but even if this is on the outside, uh, you know, from our outside scan, and that's about as hot as it gets, I feel pretty comfortable that I could put something there. Not sure what yet, but something could go there. Okay. Oops, I started moving something. My bad. All right. So we've got a fair amount of spectrum where we could start isolating things. Um, let's take some of our heavier systems like our UHFR and PSM 1000 and get those in some place. We've already got our UHFR put in an inclusion group. Not saying it's the best though, because really if you look at this um, with our uh, inclusion group here and uh, our TV channels, we really only have TV 33 available to it. So we can modify this inclusion group to say that UHFR is only going to be in TV channel 33, and then update that. Cool. Now, where else might we want to put some things? Oh, and I should update the name of that so I know where I put it. Our PSMs in J8, looks like we've got a fair amount of open spectrum. We can do TV channel 28, 29, 30, or 31. Got a little bit of space there. Our J50A, looks like it as well only has a little bit of space in 31, so that's a pretty straightforward one. It looks like our J50A, where did that end up? Great. So once we move that out of TV 33, we can put that into 31. So that'll be another inclusion group. We can create that here. This will be your LXD, J50A, and TV 31. Joke. Um, where else do we have some overlap here? Let's zoom out a little bit. So we've got H50 as well. That seems like it and J8A are going to want to fight for similar spectrum at the very least. What system do I have here? That's my H50. So H50 was able to squeeze into a little bit of space here. So I'm not going to want to restrict it too much. I think what I'll do is I'll set up an inclusion group, even though it's going to say uh, 24 through 28, for example, we'll know that it's really only going to drop into this TV channel 25 uh, slotted area and maybe a little of 28. I just don't want to have to put in those frequencies specifically. So that's going to be our H50 that ends up there. Twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. 26, what was the other one, 28, great. That looks right, so, sorry, wrong one. There we go, yeah, okay. So we'll move this one to inclusion group H50. We'll move our J50 to the J50A. And that should start moving things out of the way of one another and uh, making it a little easier for them to get their own space. The J8A 
since I've already moved the H50 out of the way, um, the J50 was never really in the way. I don't need to create an inclusion group because as you can see, we'll have a little bit of spectrum here uh, up in that two megahertz range that's still available to us, uh, the 614 to 616, um, and then whatever space that we can possibly get out of uh, the remaining TV channel 29 and 30. Take a look at our other, other overlaps here. So we've got our PSM G10, our ULXD G50, and our Axiant Digital G57. Uh, and it just so happens that basically in order of their agility, that's, that's about the same thing too. So that is in our Hall A, I believe. We can take this and our G10, Sorry, our J5, we'll start with that one. Yeah, we already put into TV channel 33. We'll take our G10. Let's see where we can put this. Got a fair amount of open spectrum here. I just want to be wise about who gets close to a TV channel and who's not. But it looks like we can take our G50 and maybe, since we've got H50 over here already, Put that kind of in the center. We can put PSM around it and then let Axiant Digital fall where it may. So we'll take G10 and say maybe put that in 21, 22, 23. This is another great example of how you can separate your ears and your mics. If you're a coordinator who likes to make sure they're separate or if you know you're going to have talent with uh, two packs on their body nearby and you need to separate those frequencies as we often do this would be one way to go about making sure that as you coordinate these mics and ears in certain spaces um, you could separate those frequencies without having problems on uh, paired frequencies on a body yeah that's a great point oh i picked the wrong one 21 22 23 All right, so that's gonna be our PSM. Yeah, and to Jason's point, if you wanna make sure that your transmit signals are in a different space than your receive signals, uh, this would be the way to do it. Okay, so our PSM's got some space now for G10. Our J8 we said was taken care of. Our G50, um, we could probably put on the lower end of the spectrum here, maybe 14, 15, 16. And then Axiom Digital in 17, 18. Yep. 19. Okay. So we've got a ULXD, the G50 band. This will be TV 14 through 16. I should update the name of that. Okay, so my G50 gets moved. And my Axiant Digital will put in 17, 18, 19, and why not 20, just in case. Um, and we'll see how far this gets us. Joke. While you're doing this, I see a question, and I think we touched on it earlier, but I just want to sure. 
make sure that we're clear here. The, the question came in earlier from Mark, and it's to confirm if, if a company brings a UHFR J5 into a show and they choose not to tune it into a forbidden frequency, is it still not legal to use based on the fact that the unit can be set to those frequencies? Um, and that is correct. The way the, the verbiage is written uh, or the language is written is that it's not even legal to be able to tune to those frequencies. So oh, that's no, why we no. came out with the bandsaw. Go ahead, Pete. Unless you can afford the $16,000 a day per a fee for you being up in that band, uh, yes, it's not legal. And that is the fee that we've that, that we've correct. seen come out here recently, which uh, we weren't entirely aware of, but that's that's the price you'll pay if you get caught. So uh, good question. Um, and yeah, any gear that's even capable of tuning to those ranges is now uh, now illegal. Yeah, excellent question. Better safe than sorry. Okay, so we've done a lot of work here. I'm just going to go ahead and get calculate and see how far we get. John, John Sulik asked, uh, are you maybe creating some less than ideal frequencies by limiting the triple beat IMD from the PSM 1000 transmits running through uh, actually all of the PSM 1000s, which are in the breakout rooms, are standalone units. They are not running through a combiner. I believe there's some in in Hall A, right? Hall A has some. Hall B has some. Yes, or Hall A has has a combiner system, but all of the <laughs> the me. majority of the PSM 1000s are standalone in the rooms and maybe you could get away without triple beat on those. Correct. I, did we take the triple beat out yet on the on the transmits? I thought we had left those in. Maybe I missed that. Um, um, yeah, for Hall A, we took them out. Okay. We put those back in. Yeah, I would say Hall A, you'd want to do that, yeah. Okay. Okay, and they are out in the breakout rooms. So we're going to unlock everything as I realize I just had those locked. We'll relock the hall that does not belong to us. So we've got about 110 right now. And as you can tell, based on uh, where we put those inclusion groups, you'll start seeing that um, more of these zones are starting to get clustered. Um, can't quite see them by device type, but you're starting to see that they're getting forced into these inclusion groups to make sure that they don't go beyond uh, that space. So it looks like we're still struggling on UHFR and PSM 1000. So let's go ahead and lock Let's see what we can't do to fix this up. So who are we missing? UHFR, PSM 1000, G10, Axiom Digital is missing a few, PSM J8 is missing a few, and ULXD is missing a few. What happens if you change the order on the, your calculation list? Would you get is there would you necessarily get more frequencies or less? Uh, let's find out. Great question. So I'm going to move all of my PSM up here. Put it after the UHFR because that I think is probably getting hit the worst right now. Sorry, I'm trying to do this on a trackpad, which I've never done before. While you're doing that, a oh. uh, couple, couple questions I see coming in here, Pete, if you don't mean, mind me jumping in. Sure. Um, at what point would you try to change your inventory? Example, not use J50A, as there's not a lot of space in that band. Um, for me, when I was in the field, this was always my first, my first uh, point of contention, was getting a scan and then trying to band plan properly ahead of time. Um, to mm -hmm. ensure the gear that was being provided would work, 
right? So in a perfect world, you're going to try to try to get this planned out as far ahead of time and then get your writer or your uh, specific gear requests to the vendor um, if you're not the vendor as a way to prevent this from happening. Um, I think in this scenario, obviously, we were handed uh, some gear that maybe we weren't allowed to select, um, which is totally a possibility in the world. But absolutely, switching out the gear would be would be something that um, I would try to do ahead of time. It's obviously easier to to have the right gear brought to site rather than change it after the fact. Um, but we're we're doing our best to make it work. We still got a couple tricks up our sleeve, I think. Uh, Pete, anything to add to that? Well, you haven't also uh, switched over to the inside scan and see Correct. where you've uh, totally shielded yourself to use some of those TV stations. So, sure. Right. That's a big so we can one. Some of those. Yep. And I think we're still we're still in standard mode on a lot of the stuff that we can go to HD. Is that correct? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I think so the, you did HD already for the ULXTs in the breakout rooms. Right. Oh, we did. Yep. Okay, so now we've got our inside scans in there as well. I'm going to recolor these so we've got a little bit of visual distinction between which scans we're operating with. So my outsides will set to a pale yellow. And all my inside scans are there. So if we unselect some of the scan data here, this actually removes it from the calculation as well. So now if we're just dealing with the inside scans, it's slightly different. This can be valuable if you've got multiple zones. If you're doing a, a red carpet and an arena show or something, you could have a scan at both locations and then select which scan you want to be coordinating for as as inputs become come your way, right? So somebody from an ENG crew that's going to be outside needs a frequency, you can select that scan, lock everything in your inventory, um, and then do a, a search for frequency based on the scan that, that you or the location that you'd like to be looking for. Yeah, so it looks like with this inside scan data, we might be in just about the same situation, largely because it's all floating right around this negative five, 85 dB. So you see that this uh, huge wash of uh, exclusions comes up basically everywhere. So this might be a scenario where... That a couple of dB, that line. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you move that to 83, I think, is what I found you get, it really pops things open, um, which, you know, without being on site and knowing exactly what, how the scan looked and knowing my scanner, maybe that's an acceptable spot, right? Mm -hmm. And then even so, you have to watch out for those DTV stations that have one edge, their actual carrier frequency still popping up really high. Right, right. There are exclusions. And now that we're working with an inside scan, what we're going to want to do is um, revisit the scan peaks. So we've got these scan peaks that are raising up here. It looks like that transmitters were probably on while this scan was taken. Um, these don't look like DTV, and I'm willing to bet that they're devices. I don't know what it is. Um, but instead of doing uh, also a generic device, um, the generic device which provides that super wide channel to channel spacing, um, I'm going to choose like an uh, Axiant analog system. And it doesn't really matter what band because all of the bands, or sorry, not Axiant Digital, the UHFR, because uh, it doesn't matter what band it is because all of the profiles for that are basically the same in the US. So what I'm going to do is set this to be like a UHFR or a a generic analog transmitter.
It looks like we don't have one compatible for that. Or that one. And that one seems to be. Uh, that one seems to be from our other scan, so we can ignore this for our next calculation. Mark points out that, you, Corey, your battery is dying. That it is. I'm <laughs> sitting out here uh, staring over the mountains, and I'm not quite ready to abandon inside to go get some power. Once I get down to 10%, uh, we'll revisit that. <laughs> this one, it seems, since it's inside a TV channel as well, I can ignore that. But this is a TV channel that we'll want to ignore. OK. So yeah, there are a couple more things that we could do here. For example, we could put Axiant Digital at high density mode. Um, but that would require us to go to the inventory and change out what this is going to be. So this is really changing the system configuration. How is it going to operate? This we go to advanced RF, change the transmission mode to HD. And if this were online, it gives you a warning that your device would reboot. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Also remember that when you reboot between high density and regular density, it resets the output level of the receiver. So if you've adjusted that, it will it will change. It bumps it up. The audio output. Audio output, yes. Correct. If you've made so changes. If, you set it, if you've set it to zero, it'll all of a sudden be plus 20. Yep. A great place where those presets come in play. If you if you do that often, you can have a saved preset for your audio output that you that you had listed before. Highlight all your all your receivers and apply that preset, and you would be right back where you were fairly quickly. So when we change that, we look at the uh, the equipment profile. It hasn't changed much, at least as far as what's presented here. So we'll leave it in standard mode, uh, but it is in HD transmission mode. So those are two different things to keep in mind, the, the transmission mode versus the compatibility profile. Uh, and with just that change, we'll see if we get any difference here. I've got a few more. Now, which, which ones did you make HD? The, uh... the Axiant Digital in the in the main hall in Correct. hall a right yep. right 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 that's fine sure and the ulxd on the on the on the band probably the guitars probably could be hd but that's only four units yeah it's only four units so i didn't bother doing it right now but i'm noticing my uh don't have an inclusion group on this so it's kind of throwing frequencies everywhere i want to put that somewhere i'm thinking Channel 30 here, so we can stay out of the way of some other folks. And just to be clear, the only hit you take with HD is the the output power that you're allowed that allows you to to um, uh, tune to. Uh, all of the latency and all of the audio um, stays exactly the same. I still want that to be before my Axiant digital. And the, the main show Axiant is all being used on the stage, so it's not going like all over the hall. So it's a, actually a fairly small transmission distance. Yep. Did I make an inclusion group for PSM? No, not for J8A. Not for J8, yeah. So where can we put that? Um, Looks like TV 29 is okay, but I may have put someone else in 29 already, so let's go a little further up, maybe 36. 
Now you're still using standard everywhere, Lucas points out, as opposed to more frequencies. Correct. Oh, okay. Craig wants to know if if HD is is such a so safe. Why not just start at HD? We absolutely could have. There's there's there is really no reason not to unless you have a long transmission um, distance that you're really looking to cover. Um, it's. I mean, obviously the little breakout rooms are no brainer. Why correct. why anything other than HD? Um, it's really it's really a distance factor is what it comes down to if you've got a long throw. But um, the mo we, we see it a lot more often as people get more comfortable with it and understand um, that really the only thing that changes is the output power. So there's there's no definitive answer there, Craig. It's um, we give you the power tools and give you the options. And I might even want to unlock these frequencies that I found here because they're already um, taking up some of my spectrum for me. So when I move these guys over, put them all in their inclusion groups. You should do a save before it shuts down. You're already into the red. Oh, yeah, good call. Just a time notification here, and I'm I'm sure we don't mind going a bit over, but we're pushing up about 10 minutes to the two hours here, Corey. Just to okay. FYI. Well, it's clear that with a little bit of tweaking, you're going to be able to get them all in, mm -hmm. uh, and, and particularly with the the inside scan opening up a lot of spectrum. And of course. This is only the first half of the whole process. You've got to put the frequencies in and look at them all up with your spectrum analyzer and plug yep. them all in and and war game them, uh, which I find that the receivers are so much better at receiving than a spectrum analyzer. I like to war game because you'll see at problems come up on the receiver where you won't see it on your spectrum analyzer. Mm -hmm. very, very good point. I'm laughing a little bit here at this this question that came in from John Christie. He says, maybe just move the compa compatibility settings for Hall B to more frequencies. <laughs> dot dot dot. Do we really care? Do we really care about those Hall B people? <laughs> you know what, John? Oh, well, like we you. don't care. You're a smart guy. You need That's what right. they get. So exactly, we could go tell them. <laughs> exactly. Turn your stuff to high density, even though it's Sennheiser. Ooh. All right, getting pretty close. <laughs> Not quite there. I that was funny. So we'll see what happens when we also take out some of these guys. And ULXD, since they're in HD mode, already don't have the three tone third order. So we'll take right. our PSMs out of that. Getting a little closer. Not quite there, though. And I wouldn't worry about the time because going over is a specialty here at, at Practical Show Tech. <laughs> we never end on time. It's just like I'm on a on a real broadcast. Overtime? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a commercial break. Yeah, right. Yeah, you want to check with the TD and see if we can run into overtime? Oh, it's it's live to tape. We'll be here all night. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so what can we tweak in Hall A? So we've got UHFR sitting in TV33. So that should be fine. PSM is in 2123.
Mark Hanna asks, he said, what's the reasoning behind not applying updates between the inventory and coordination lists, such as inclusion, inclusion groups and RF zone? Uh, great question as well. Uh, a while back, I want to say maybe version 611 is when we started getting a lot of requests to make frequency coordination a bit more um, a bit more flexible and not tying it directly to um, your inventory. It used to be in versions like 6.10 and prior that anything that you had in your inventory got calculated no matter you wanted one frequency or you wanted 100 frequencies. So it didn't allow for a lot of flexibility. By decoupling them in some way and making it very explicit how and when you bring things in, um, it's it makes it easier for people to not have to rely on the inventory. You can coordinate to your heart's content and do all your band planning there. Um, so if you were truly trying to figure out which equipment you would want, I wouldn't worry about the inventory. I would start right in frequency coordination and just start calculating things and then switching bands out if things weren't working. Um, I mean, obviously, list, you're doing this coordination before you're on site, which is what we all like to do. Uh, you can have the shop change it to a different piece of equipment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, we didn't do it this way, but you can just add frequencies and add gear from this specific window he's in as well. Um, you can bring more stuff in from this window and then you can deploy it to inventory and vice versa. Um, it's really just a workflow perspective on on how you want to do things. All right, so I'm trying to keep an eye out if I made some inclusion groups that don't allow me to use things. And it looks like there are a couple here that I'm not using. So it looks like 26, 27 I'm not using. So those H50s, if I'm having a problem with those, rather than just being in 30, I can find room in 26, 7, and I'll leave it out of 29 for now. So I'll add 26 and 27 of those. Eric asks, uh, isn't putting everything in inclusion zones restricting the option of WWV to calculate frequencies all over the place? Well, of course it is, but it's mm -hmm. part of the band planning issue. If you want to keep your wireless mics out of your in-ears or your IEM uh, uh, channels, I, I don't usually don't care about IFB channels, even if they're, they're uh, um PSM 1000s because usually they they don't get overdriven, but but in ear monitors often get overdriven, and I like to keep my mics away from them. Hey Corey, are we are we accounting for inner mods in all of our zones or just direct? Um, I think. Wait, what do you mean by are we accounting for them in all of our zones? So between zones, if you go to your manage RF zones, mm -hmm. um, are we accounting for channel spacing and intermod products or just channel spacing? I don't remember at the beginning how we set this up. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, so for hall A, it's intermods and channel spacing everywhere. Yep. For floor one, it's just how we interact with hall A for floor uh, two, it's also how we interact with hall A and then channel spacing between the two breakouts. Okay. Okay. So um, to John's point earlier about um, setting everything to more frequencies here, this is where we can also uh, decide how much we want to care about that other hall. And right now, we cared a lot, right? So we said for Hall A, yep. which has some significant wireless, we also care about these intermod products. We could see what happens if we were to deselect that. Couple more. Yeah, it jumps us to 115 pretty quickly. Let's just put my ULXD after my Axiom Digital, which I did not mean to do. Yeah, that's a better order.
right now I'm just ta taking a scan, looking through to see if there are any TV channels that maybe I omitted from my inclusion groups, and that's why things aren't falling there. Like, for example, my H50, I think I left and stopped around TV channel 30, but it looks like I've got some space in 32 and 34 to get another frequency there. 30 was excluded, right? Uh, 30, I think, has the inclusion group on it, meaning to put frequencies there. 29 looks looks acceptable as well, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So here's our H50. We got 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. So a fair amount of space. 30, missing 29, though. And our PSM, so we put that in TV 36. Okay. Uh, we also have available to us these other two megahertz here on the outside. All right, down to 8%. I might be moving inside in a moment. Well, we're almost there. Almost there. You're a lot more sanguine about your battery than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I move inside when it's at like 50%. <laughs> Me and this horse have been to hell and back. I trust this thing to get down to 1% and then still chug along for a little while. Okay, so it looks like we're missing a handful here. Clear UHFR. Oh yeah, it looks like it's got 32 available to it. A, that is covered, J5, and our H50, okay. There we go, there's the MAC notification. One more time, Corey. Go to go to your zone management. I just want to look at what your inner mod your inner mod properties are selected for. Are you let's see, floor one, floor two. Okay. So it's just hall A for inner mods, right? Yeah, yeah. just hall just A. Hall A inner mods across the board. Okay. Now, do you have to do inner mods against the high density in the breakout rooms? I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, in your in your in your in your list there, you were doing inner mods between Hall A and the and the breakout rooms, but I guess that was primarily for the PSM 1000s. Primarily, yeah. Yeah, it'll be it'll be shut off due to the the HD mode um, in terms of its math once you do that. Okay. Give me one second while I step inside and plug in. We'll hold our breath. <laughs> Hopefully you make it. <laughs> so, interesting thing for me compared to doing this on uh, IAS is it is a totally different workflow. Uh, yep. uh, in IAS, what I did was basically say, okay, I'm going to use channel 33 for this thing. And I put it in there. Here, you have so much more flexibility in playing with where you're putting it and recalculating and changing the, the, uh, the, uh, 
just the, the the specifics of how you're doing where you're putting stuff and then just click on recalculate which in IAS you don't have that flexibility that's right <laughs> Harry you're making me laugh he says uh, don't forget about the 10 backup frequencies left to add oh right <laughs> <laughs> all right so that's good this one is also not in more frequencies. Okay. So I think I'm restricting my UHFR by a little too much here. Yeah, I think the, inclusion, the inc inclusion groups, I think, are a little tight in certain spaces. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think that was 34, 35. Okay. Hopefully that helps out our UHFR a little bit. Okay, it's chugging along, but topping out at 116. Let's see what else we can move around. Which ones is it not finding? Uh, PSM and G10 and J8 and UHFR in J5. No help to move those some of those PSMs to a different band because there were several bands available. We haven't done anything in VHF yet for that. Uh, so we don't have PSM and uh, and oh, VHF, true. but right. yeah, um, we might be able we to. We do have an X55. That would do. That would do it. How many should Nine, we move over there? Nine four four, baby. So it looks like our J8 is fine here. Our G10 is not. We need about five from there and five from here. So 10 frequencies. So I'll use this as an opportunity to show how you can add frequencies on the fly from the coordination workspace to be in here and we'll create the devices thereafter. Now, same, same in, 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 in Workbench, every time you hit calculate, it starts with a different random number. So you could change, right? Did that make a big difference? Uh, what's the question? Well, when you hit, re, hit calculate every time, it's starting with a different random number. So mm -hmm. if you hit it a couple of times, you might get a few more frequencies in there. Yeah, a few more here and there. Because we're still struggling to get these last like 12 of them, I don't expect that we're going to get a, a radically different number. Uh, so I let it chug for a little while. And it right. um, that counter that you'll see at the bottom, um, that's going through basically to the end. The saying, I found a pretty decent calculation that got me pretty far. I'm going to hold on right. to that and use that as my baseline and um, right. start with a new random number and then start a different calculation thread that goes that way. Now we're going to post with the uh, with the video this uh, workbench file as well as the all the information on the IAS which I posted with IAS on on that show. Okay, so if great. You have the programs you people can cut, take it and start fiddling with it themselves from this point. Yeah, I think one of the yeah, important things you know here is that you know you nudge that threshold a couple dB, boom right this is we're purposely building something here that's quite quite conservative from an rf standpoint right and 
Um, I think the other thing that's important as we're as we start to look at shows and they begin to emerge again is the importance of of that broad inventory, right? That you know here we purposely are trying to stay, you know, pretty constrained there, but. You know the the idea of 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 working through this ahead of time before you're you're on site number one, and saying hey you know what I the X band the V band whatever that is from whatever manufacturer the 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 different things are we we a lot of times I think get constrained by what we typically have right and uh, you know this was purposely a mega convention right Pete. Um, I like I like where this is because there's a lot of handles that I'm I'm looking at um, being pulled and and I think that's the the magic of RF management, you know, uh, lots absolutely. of handles to pull. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And some of those handles are bigger than others, and things that you may not necessarily want to pull until you get there. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pulling out three tone, third order uh, inner mods, I feel a little more comfortable doing that uh, more readily than I do moving my exclusion threshold, for example. Sure. Um, you know, I like mine at, you know, negative 85, somewhere plus or minus to uh, DBM. But um, yeah, other things like setting up inclusion groups to, to segment things, which is really more of a constraint than it is a liberation. Um, but yeah, it's all about the order in which you do stuff and doing it according to your own tolerance. Mm -hmm. Eric is saying, why do you bother having Intermod between Hall A and the breakouts? Uh, you've got a whole hallway in between them. Well, the reality is you might be able to pad down your PSM 1000s to a particularly low level in the breakout rooms, but a PSM 1000, across a 25 foot or 30 foot hallway is is still very receivable so i think you'd want to have the intermod to start with yeah and I th again i think without being on site we're, we've taken a very conservative approach here look there we go there's your 128 there's you did it Corey. ding um uh it, it had it's been pretty conservative in terms of intermods uh, we're not there we're we're doing our best to stay as conservative as possible before we got on site and work with what the gear we were given. Um, yeah, you got sure. to the, you got to the 128, but you had to use more than one battery. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right. So for our backups, we'll start with uh, the hall a look at this. I love it. He's not satisfied. That's what oh, we love about Corey, man. Send it, send it, Corey. Go. Yes. Um, so a couple ways to add backups. You can right click on something and say add backups. You can enter a number or just like tap this thing rapidly to get there. Uh, let me make sure that I'm adding backups in the right places. So for hall A, we had some uh, UHFR. Yeah, this is our band here. Looks like we're gonna want at least two for each one of those, right? Mm-hmm. UHFR, ULXD, we will add one, two. Or did it take both? Yeah, it did. Okay. Uh, ULXD. Come here. And then for our convention, we might, what do you think, two more for each one of those? Well, they are running on frequency diversity, but I would say uh, just a couple more total. A couple more total. Yeah, so maybe 14 total for this guy, four total yep. for that. Yep. I think I added three extra ones. So, yeah, the right click is one way to do it. Once you've already got it, there's a little plus symbol over here that you can just um, add more to it. Collapse this again. Now the Hall B stuff is that just not showing up on this screen? You've not yet because you haven't selected it. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So the zone, Hall yeah, B the is a different zone over here. Um, oh, this one I just sort right. of locked down indefinitely and said, you know what, right. that's you guys are doing on your own. All right. So in the breakout rooms, we've got. Um, let's see. 
What do you think? One extra one per room, two extra per room? Oh, I would say uh, one or two per side. One or of, two per yeah. side, okay. Oh, yeah. So in that case, we'll only need two extra because we're we'll duplicate this yep. side. Yep. yep. So which ones seem to be the most available? I think VHF we kept getting without issue. So if we're okay using VHF, then we can have a couple. Well, I think you need at least one backup in each of those bands then. Oh, in each band, not just each band. You count okay. on moving the equipment around, although they are right. single. Right. Okay, and our PSM, is it one per room? So that'll be, what do you think? One extra frequency for each of these, maybe two for X55. That'll give us four extra PSM total. Yep. See how far we get. Oh, so another thing to note is that when you're calculating and you've got backup frequencies, there's a distinction to make here when you're looking at this. Um, Workbench is going to want to go through and calculate all of your primary frequencies first to make sure that you've got that. That's the heart of your request. The backups, we treat like backups to say that, um, you know, if you can't get them, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world, but you must have those primary frequencies. So what you'll see is that we cleared, um, even as an example, what I'm highlighted here on PSM 1000, all of the primary frequencies are there. We've even reached well beyond our, our 128 frequencies, but now it's turning through and trying to figure out where to put those backups. Uh, the same thing is true for Hall A here, if I take a look. Um, we've gotten all our primary frequencies, but now working on those backups. Harry McCann points out that the uh, the scan with a minus 85 dB noise floor seems a little high, uh, and you won't know that until you actually get on site. Because obviously this scan was done on site, and it was an actual show I did work on, and it really was minus 85 dB noise floor, because we're in New York City here. Yeah, that's terrifying. You should move, Pete. You should do a show in a different city with a lower noise floor. This that's, is like a lot of work. Neg that, neg 85 is usually the, the one of the last places I would look to put. Maybe stuff that's what we should start doing. It's have all these convention centers and and arenas and stadiums publish their their noise threshold, right? Exactly. Or a RF, and then we're just going to pick the lowest number, so you know Perfect. we don't have to, which is the biggest number, right? So that's right. <laughs> Yeah, come on, man. We're living in post. We're living mid COVID here. Probably, so, you know, probably. let's change the dynamic. We're going to, we're just going to ask questions differently now. Neg 100 or bust. That's Harry, it. maybe I should put a pad on it. Well, I think if I put a mask on it, then it'll be less noise floor. Hey. Isn't that the equivalent, though, of an RF pad? Just so it's an RF mask. It's a, right. it, you have to wear your pad over your nose and your mouth. So I need my N minus 100 pad. Exactly. Um, Pete, do you remember what the noise floor was like in the auditorium where I work? Oh boy, it uh, sounds loaded. It it wasn't bad, well, was it? Yeah. No, I think it's <laughs> extremely low, and it's it's well, right well, across you, the street from World you're Trade Center. Buried, you're buried inside of a building. I think that that it, yeah. It, well, it was ground 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 floor of an office building. Yeah, yeah. It's Definitely not, it's not in a it's not in a basement. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at it here. It looks like we don't have much in TV channel 17, 18, 19, mm -hmm. which we can probably use for our PSM here. So I'm going to open that one up. J8. That's interesting. Yeah. J8 eight here. Maybe we put all our spares in the G10 then. You know, and that's sure. That's where we go. So I'll pop this open. Goodbye to that backup. All right. The two there. All right, I think that's how it was. And then we'll update our inclusion group. 
That was our PSM G10, 17, 18, 19, was it, or 17, 18? 19 as well, I think. Yeah, there's three there. Yeah, you can really organize. For those uh, with, uh, you know, the RFOCD, this is like color yeah. coding and organizing. There's a whole nother tab to this software called Monitor. Yeah, we haven't even gotten there yet. Right? It's for now, another day. That's right. That's right. This was just about getting the coordination. Once you get in there, then you can get that monitor tab open and go to town. RFOCB, man. That's right. I love it. All right. Not a whole lot came out of that 17, 18, 19. That's surprising. It's intriguing. There's got to there's, there's gotta be something that's blocking those out. Um, it's because I, I've locked the frequencies that I've got so far in my 143, so it's not ah, a lot of flexibility there. I, I don't really want to blow that one hey, away. But, can, you know. can you show yeah. the intermons real quick? Oh, sure. Maybe that cool. will visualize uh, a little bit here in terms of what's going on in the math behind. There we go. Look at that. Jesus. A solid <laughs> light blue bar. There you go. <laughs> So if we Even if you, just, if you just go to two ton. by threes, yeah. Yeah, let's just look at two, three. Even that is quite a bit of stuff there. Um, I am going to unlock this stuff so uh, I can also demonstrate this, but let's say I unlock this frequency. I don't believe that feature was uh, available the last time we did this webinar. Uh, series and that may be important to talk about we added this yeah, this correct. visualization and there's some cool things you can do with moving a frequency around and visualizing how the inner mods move um, mm. just some sprinkles yeah. thanks for bringing that up jason so in the right hand yeah. corner we added this little section here where you can turn on and off the visualization of those inner mods um, and it's going to be for everything that's out there, everything that's in your coordination workspace. If you just move the frequency, you'll see that the inner mods get updated in the plot. But if you, I think it's Alt, and hold it and drag it, or sorry, it's uh, there you Apple go. Command, yeah. you'll see the math being calculated on the back end to see exactly Ooh. the effect of, uh -huh. of moving that frequency around. So that could be really helpful. I find it more helpful when there are fewer frequencies that you start with and you don't have a wall of uh, inner mods here. Um, but that does explain a little bit about, um, about how those equipment profiles and the spacing parameters interact. So this is all the energy that's being generated by the interaction of multiple signals. Um, and you might also throw in, say for example, your um, your equipment profile spacing. So this wasn't part of the last demonstration either, but you could see for a given frequency, what's its channel to channel spacing. So if you really care about like, why is it, why am I hitting this impasse and I can't seem to find it? It's because of stuff like this. Um, so this being your channel to channel spacing, it means that it has to be at least this far away from the next frequency. Um, but then there's also other spacings like your uh, 2T3O where um, it shouldn't be there. Since I just moved this frequency, you're seeing those fall in here, in which case this should show up as incompatible. Um, let me turn on my compatibility here. Did you exclude channels 14, 15, 16? Exclude no. them? No, they look open here. It's a good point, though, that, that, that was They're brought in by, by Mark. Yeah, they're not usable in New York City. They should have been excluded. Uh, okay, gotcha. Well, that's going to change quite a bit. That's a yeah. public safety thing. Yeah, and that would mm -hmm. be the zip code. That's That would come in the zip code entry, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so we oh, we didn't put the scans now. in. We didn't use the zip code Correct. at all. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. So we're going to unlock everything again, but keep our hall B where it's at. 14, 15, 16, you say? Correct. Right. Okay, let me make sure I don't have any inclusion groups that force something over there, because then we're just not gonna find anything. That's 31. Oh, there we go. Real XDG 50, 14, 15, 16. 
So you gotta find somewhere else to put those. Okay. And just for reference, earlier this week, I did a, a, a demo of this um, this kit and I, I did everything in more frequency, everything in HD mode, no exclusion groups. Um, I did take 14, 15, 16 out and I was up to like 186 that I could get in terms of some very loose parameters, not not accounting for intermods through zones, um, things like that. So so we we we're being very vigilant about how we're coordinating in this specific example. Um, it is possible to get much more frequencies out of this if you were to to dial some some things back. It's we're really just trying to show you the amount of uh, levers you can pull to make this uh, super specific sure. to your needs. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think we have to to uh, beat a dead horse. Uh, not yeah. that the horse is dead, but but uh, but it it this this is obviously the way any coordination with these many frequencies is going to go. It's a lot of uh, massaging to go along uh, to make it all work. And often, often uh, until you get on site and actually maybe find out that that you can't receive between. The back out room, the back, the, the 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 breakout rooms and hall A, which might free up a lot, you know, turn off your mm -hmm. your third orders there. Yeah, that's a great point. And being on site is always going to be really helpful. This is a great place to start. So, yeah, yep. with what we've started, we can see that we've gotten all of our primary frequencies. What we're obsessing over at this point now is getting those backup frequencies and yep. making sure we've got some headroom uh, and not worrying ourselves when we get on site. But uh, to the point about how the zones interact, if we get to the um, to the venue and find out that once we fire up all the transmitters on, say, one side, uh, breakout floor one, if we're not experiencing much of that when we do a scan in, uh, in hall A, then maybe we don't really care about it. I would absolutely recommend scanning with both the door closed and the door open just to see uh, that you don't run into some problems as people are entering and exiting that hall. Yep. Um, but uh, that could lead you to some better insight about what's capable and what's not. Yeah, I got a note here also that uh, uh, once you get on site, directional antennas may uh, uh, save a whole lot of uh, yep. issues and and decouple some of the rooms as it were 100 mm percent -hmm. yeah this is um okay. this is one of the things that's you know there's always that dilemma with budgeting right oh we don't have the money to go do a site visit right to get this or that um or you know this is the inventory we have you can see here number one i think uh one of the important things for taking away obviously this is a very large this would be a larger event right but the idea of of looking at that doing this initial plot that raises a bunch of red flags very quickly you know when we first started this we started seeing all those where okay let's talk about the amount of inventory we didn't talk about the fact that this very well could have been four vendors mm. do you know providing <laughs> this you know um the, so there's a lot of questions that we want to be asking and i you know i noticed as we were doing this where where are those points where those questions those flags start to pop up and you and you make your notes okay the constraints are we just putting constraints on ourselves because we make those assumptions or do we ask those questions of, okay well are there are there inventory yeah the band's touring I don't expect to be able to to have a lot of flexibility there. No problem. But I can yeah. go over here and I can say, okay, well, my breakouts. What do I want to use? Where where do I go? All those things. So I think um, uh, what what we saw was exactly what we wanted to with this whole exercise, Pete, which is to say, you know, how do I take something that is pretty complex using you know probably the two most prevalent platforms and start that. And uh, it still doesn't. Uh, it still doesn't let us not see what's really going on day of. You know, as this stuff's going yeah. in. Uh, obviously, this is not a one day put in um, without that that prep time up front. And so this those, is included of the oh by the ways, right? Uh -huh. At a course with twenty three wireless mics walk in. You know that kind of stuff. And, and it's all also not. Things. 
an automatic process where you push a button and it does it. Exactly. It's, right. As, as much as a lot I, of, would, I wish for that. Yeah. I, but, I, I want that. You just hire Pete. Right? There you go. Oh, I, I'll just hire that. Corey. There we go. <laughs> and then all we do is just keep pushing buttons. Um, exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. So anyhow, you know, this is, uh, um, you know, I, I like that you just keep going at it, Corey. Um, this is, uh, you know, it's always the backups, man, that get you. The man um, on a mission. That get you, but always you is. Just, you, yeah, this is the, and this is the challenge. And this is why, you know, as much as we talk about so many opportunities opening up with new hardware and, and thank goodness, in some cases, our comms have moved to oh. these different bands, you know. Yeah. Imagine the conversation we'd be having right now trying to get our um, 12 uh, BTR systems working as well, right? Um, no, no. But um, looking through your system, you know, just to kind of recap a few things from our other RF sessions we've talked about, looking at this through your antenna system that you're using, right? What are the pictures mm -hmm. it would be giving us that would be different? Maybe better, maybe worse than the scans uh, Pete had. Um, the um, never give up, never surrender to quote Galaxy Quest. Um, and uh, that's kind of what RF is about, is just always looking at that, always having everything on the table. It's going to yep. be, you know, bringing your COVID RF mask um, for attenuating signals. Um, all those, all those things. So. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Jason, for for really taking us deep into that. I, I we should have probably we'll have to throw this on the best of Pete and Mac on the, there we go. just the just the changing around the inner mod right and watching that yeah, move yeah, in the yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah. That's a really great the, scene. It's, it's the screen. visualization. You know, um, are we moving to that point with RF where we need to visualize it more? Is it easier to understand? the effects that this lever is having when I can see that. And I would argue the answer is yes, yeah, that yeah. people are visual, that the next generation of RF managers coming in are gonna be even more visual than we are and the tools necessary. Um, I love what I was seeing there. So, and- uh, So again, uh, we'll, we'll include the, Corey will send me the file and we'll stick it in with the, uh, with the uh, video. So if you all wanna go in and play with it yourself, you'll have that file. And the first person to get to 200 frequencies wins a, 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 a free trip to somewhere. So. <laughs> um, well, that would be nowhere because we're not paying for anything. Exactly. Um, exactly. I just I'd like to point that out right now. I'm I'm sorry, but I am that guy in in our team that's just I'm the crusher of ideas and cool things. But free trip to anywhere. You just have to drive your own car. That's right. You have to drive your own car and pay for your own place and buy your own food. We we could probably provide you at least two sanitizers, though. Um, perhaps. Nope. Nope. Sounds nope. Like I'm going to negate that right now because we we only have like 300 left. So um, uh, anyhow, thanks everybody for being a part of this. Thanks again for the hard work, Corey and Jason, um, and you know everybody watching. Uh, next week, it's Pete. Um, and if uh, Mac, I'm not sure I will be out next week. Uh, I'm backpacking. So, um, right. well, you know, but, they do have internet on the uh, 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 sat phone. So, uh, I, I, I am not going to, I am not logging on from the Appalachian Trail. I could, but it's really expensive. Um, if Elon Musk would get this Starlink done, that would have been perfect for me. But he, obviously, yeah. I asked him and he, he talked about it. He's like, I might, but probably not. Um, Anyhow, Pete's going to be on next week talking about comms. I mean, the from the the what the can and string. No, you, no digital next week. Just no digital. Old two wire comms. Oh my. Yeah. Nice. yeah so we're going to go back and, and and ironically enough, there's a lot of that out there. So those of you who know yeah. houses of worship, schools, um, the, when you understand some of the fundamentals of where comms came from, and still are running. Um, uh, house spots everywhere you go. Exactly, house spots house, still alive and well. Um, like so, temporary control room. We're down to a one-channel RTS. There you go. go. There it is. <laughs> so you know, join Pete next week. We got two sessions that he's going to be doing. And the week after that, we're doing a uh, a paid-for 
you know, a pay to attend one with our stage uh, managers from the uh, London Olympics. That one is really, I'll, I'll tell you what, it's worth the $15 investment because the groups will be in such size that you could get in, get a lot of your questions answered. Those ladies are just brilliant. So that's the next two weeks. So, um, Mac, Pete, anything before we break no, for the weekend? It. It's it. Excellent. Well, on that good note, weekend. everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks again, Corey. Thanks again, Jason. And uh, we'll Thanks be talking. Thanks for having us. So, right. uh, Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.